We live in a vast sea of energy. Everything, every atom, every subatomic particle is in constant motion, spinning eternally. Even in the cold, dark, absolute vacuum of empty space, there exists what new physics is calling the quantum vacuum flux. It is the ether of the ancients, the life force energy of metaphysics, are the random fluctuations of this vast field of potential in which space and time are embedded. Now, theoretically and mathematically proven, the question no longer is, does this zero-point energy exist? But rather, can we tap this inexhaustible resource of free and unlimited energy and manifest new technologies which are both inexpensive and environmentally safe? One thing is certain, if we continue on the course of rapidly burning fossil fuels and relying on nuclear fission, the future of our civilization is in grave jeopardy. We're at a critical juncture where the ravages of industrial pollution and radioactive waste have exceeded the carrying capacity of Mother Earth. Our finite reserves of oil and gas will be completely exhausted by the year 2025 at the present rate of consumption. Large corporate and governmental self-interest ignore this pending crisis and resist change to the status quo. The question must be asked, is this the kind of world we want to pass down to future generations? Emerging on the frontiers of science, a pioneering breed of theoretical physicists and inspired inventors are challenging the way we think about harnessing the unseen forces of nature. Despite ridicule, lack of funding, and outright suppression, they are confronting an outmoded classical worldview and ushering in a monumental scientific revolution. In this program, you will witness the groundbreaking work of tireless inventors and visionary scientists who may hold the keys to true energy independence for every person on Earth. From Nikola Tesla to the reality of coal fusion and beyond, join us as we present Free Energy. The race to zero point. Most people would agree you can't get something for nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And yet, we get our oxygen free from the air we breathe. We get sunlight free and water. That used to be free until bottled drinking water came along. But what about energy? We've always had to pay for that, whether it's wood or coal, oil or electricity. It's always been the rule that you can never get back more energy than what you put in in the first place. That's a fundamental law of nature. Physicists of the 19th century figured that out with the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Maybe so. But science has come a long way since then. And laws? Well, there's never been one that hasn't been broken. At the turn of the last century, Nikola Tesla, the great inventor who gave us alternating current and the Tesla coil, stated, Electric power is everywhere present in unlimited quantities. I can drive the world's machinery without the need of coal, oil, gas, or any other fuel. This new power for the driving of the world's machinery will be derived from the energy which operates the universe, the cosmic energy. With over 200 patents to his name, Tesla was well on his way to transmitting electric power without wires when he ran into trouble with J.P. Morgan and the financial interest of 1901. His ambitious Wardenclyffe project to magnify and transmit power to ships at sea and eventually to provide free electricity for the whole world was scuttled by Morgan, leaving Tesla penniless and disillusioned. The wealthy industrialist of the time knew that their vast plans to wire the world with copper from the mines they owned 
would be upset if they could no longer control the supply and means of delivery. Tesla's beliefs about developing technology in harmony with nature conflicted with the prevailing American attitude at the time that mankind was put on earth to subdue and dominate nature. Little by little, Tesla was denounced as a crackpot and deleted from the historical record. At the time of his death in 1943, Tesla's truckloads of scientific papers were seized by U.S. government agencies. Who knows what ideas and remarkable devices our world could have inherited if only his genius was recognized. When J.P. Morgan prohibited Tesla from broadcasting uh, electric power overseas with Ward and Cliff Tower, he said, I can't put a meter on it, therefore I won't finance it. Uh, that literally changed the course of history and for the past almost 100 years we've been uh, suffering under that um, profit motive. Of course, one could say that mankind was hardly ready to handle the awesome forces Tesla had glimpsed. The 20th century would bring world wars and technological innovations far more horrific than had ever been witnessed by Western civilization. Even before Tesla, the groundwork that would lead to free energy had been pioneered by great scientists like Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell. In 1831, Faraday modeled his rotating magnet and disk generator after the Earth, whose rotation around a molten metal core keeps the planet spinning in a self-sustaining magnetic field. His work later resulted in the development of the dynamo. Also called a homopolar or unipolar generator, the Faraday generator provides the basis for much of what is being done today in the electromagnetic approach to free energy, such as with Bruce De Palma's In Machine and Paramahamsa Tiwari's Space Power Generator. Repeated experiments have detected anomalous electrical outputs greater than that used to rotate the disk. The friction and voltage limitations have hampered efficiency and therefore widespread acceptance. James Clerk Maxwell, best known for his Maxwell's equations, is reputed to have set things straight with his theories of electrical properties in a way that eliminates zero-point energy. But Maxwell's more advanced work allowed for the existence of an ether, a substance finer than air, which since the time of Plato had been considered a scientific fact. Well, the prevailing belief of the time was that the vacuum was a thin material fluid, the so-called material ether which we know today is false. The ether is there, but it's not the observable material fluid. Faraday had re-established this notion of lines of force, but he thought the electromagnetic field or the electromagnetic disturbances in the ether, so to speak, was really twanging strings. The strings were under tension, and when you had a disturbance, what you really did was pluck the strings. Now, Maxwell states very clearly that he set about to actually capture exactly what Faraday was doing in his lines of force in the theory and that's what he did. Maxwell's actual theory is 20 equations and 20 unknowns in quaternions which is a higher topology algebra. You can do things in that that you can't dream of in doing in tensors and you certainly can't do in vectors and you certainly can't do with the theory that's taught at our universities. All that remains to be rediscovered and uncovered. The now famous michelson morley experiment at the turn of the century failed to detect a stationary ether, so classical physics presumed once and for all that it did not exist. The case was closed until quantum mechanics reopened the discussion, allowing for a new interpretation of how matter interacts with a zero-point field. Most of our scientific community actually believes that empty space, the nature of, of, of space itself, is completely empty, devoid of anything. And historically, it's very interesting because in the 1800s and even earlier, they believed there was an ether, an all-pervading substance filling up space. And in 1905, when relativity theory became very popular, they said, well, we don't need this ether. It's comp uh, empty space is empty. Then 25 years or 20 years later, in 1925, when quantum mechanics comes into play, all of a sudden, a new energy appears in equations of quantum mechanics. And it has to be there to make the equations work. And it has to, it has to do with fluctuations of electromagnetic field energy at a very high frequency that interacts with everything. And they called this the zero point energy. And it turns out that all the elementary particles interact with this energy and it becomes a potential energy source. That's what we're discovering today. 
Well, free energy is basically, uh, in another word for it, is zero-point energy. It's energy that is contained within the vacuum of space and which is virtually undetectable by any traditional means. In fact, uh, the, the energy is uh, homogeneous and isotropic, the same everywhere, the same in all directions. And because of that, it's uh, trying to extract it or measure it is sort of like the problem of trying to weigh a beaker of water underneath the surface of the ocean. Uh, what do you measure with respect to what? And that's been the physicist's dilemma, and we've gone down uh, one very large cul-de-sac this century. Uh, the cul-de-sac meaning that there is no such thing as consciousness. There is no such thing as this zero-point field, or this, this place from which the energy can come. And uh, the answer now appears to be yes, because uh, theoretical physics and a number of experiments and quantum mechanics show very clearly the existence of this, this all-pervasive electromagnetic field called the zero-point field. In fact, although skeptics often point to Einstein's theory of relativity, it was Einstein who in 1920 said, There are weighty arguments to be adduced in favor of the ESA hypothesis. To deny the ESA is ultimately to assume that empty space has no physical qualities whatsoever. The fundamental facts of mechanics do not harmonize with this view. According to the general theory of relativity, space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, space without ether is unthinkable. The term vacuum has been used in several totally different senses. Uh, some engineers use it to mean you just pump out all the air and that's called a vacuum and that's vacuum technology. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about empty space-time. We know today, for example, the Lamb shift in quantum mechanics showed that th this exchange of energy between the vacuum and the charged particles is in fact real and generates real effects. And you can measure it, and he was given the Nobel Prize, Lamb was, for doing that kind of measurement and showing it in the physics literature. So we know it's real. Experimentally it's detected. The Casimir shift, for example, shows clearly that it's there, and it does generate energetic effects in your actual materials. It turns out that in the modern view, the modern quantum mechanical view, if you apply that knowledge that's been gained there, what you find is that the vacuum is fiercely active. It's a fierce energy flux and going in all directions at all times. The energy density of that, as estimated by various physicists, is extremely high. Uh, for example, in one cubic centimeter, if you could take the raw energy in that cubic centimeter and condense it into mass, divided by c squared, you would have more observable mass result from that than our largest telescope can see in the observable universe and all the stars and planets today. And so the, the energy that's there is extremely dense and extremely fierce. This drives everything that we call physical reality from the quantum level right on up to the observed level and the observed world that we live in. Everything is energetically driven by the vacuum. The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats was a revolutionary book written by T. Henry Moray, an electrical engineer and Tesla enthusiast who in the early 20s began working on a device he claimed intercepted radiant energy from outer space. His solid state detector, the Moray valve, was designed with a complex series of semiconductors, high voltage capacitors and transformers hooked up to an antenna and a ground wire. By stimulating the existing oscillations of space energy, his radiant energy device ran for days putting out 50 kilowatts of electricity. His public demonstrations attracted newspaper coverage and scientists from Bell Laboratories and the Department of Agriculture's Rural Electrification Administration. Although no one could find evidence of fraud, neither could anyone explain how the radiant energy device worked. During the 30s, he developed semiconductors and transistors that were far ahead of their time. Unfortunately, as all too many inventors have suffered, when he refused to sell out to powerful interest, Moray and his family were threatened shot at, and the laboratory ransacked. Ignored by the U.S. Patent Office, Moray quietly stopped public disclosure of the device after it was destroyed by his assistant, Felix Frazier, a 
communist sympathizer who was frustrated when Moray declined his repeated offers to take that technology to Russia. Today, Moray's sons, John and Richard, continue to pursue their father's dream. In Europe, Victor Schauberger's vortex experiments during the 1930s resulted in an advanced understanding of how the spiraling motions inherent in all natural systems reverse the effects of entropy. By studying the properties of inwardly spiraling water, he created an implosion generator that concentrated electrical charge. Victor Schauberger is one of my heroes who talked about a, a possible science based on the the uh, inward motion rather than the let's explode everything, blow, break it up and, and uh, study the atom by breaking it up into little pieces. Let's study the atom by looking at uh, how it wants to move naturally in a spiraling motion. And the same with uh, everywhere you look in nature. Schauberger's ideas became widely known before World War II when he was coerced to work for the Nazis on exotic discs that resembled flying saucers, as well as his energy generator. In 1958, he traveled to the United States where he was told he could manufacture his devices. But he was duped into signing over all of his rights, and none of his inventions were ever developed. Returning to Austria, he died a bitter and broken man. Visionary philosopher, artist, and scientist Walter Russell's contributions to the understanding of energy are significant, even though ignored by mainstream academia. Russell's revised periodical table of the elements, based on a spiral, predicted many unknown elements and isotopes like plutonium and deuterium. His cosmological theories about the mystical nature of reality challenged physicists to think in terms of energy, light, and matter as one substance. There's electricity in the air. It's a common expression and one that's true. Take a comb, run it through your hair on a dry day, and you can get a static shock. Sure, it's electricity, all right, but could it also be tapped to produce sufficient energy we could all use? Benjamin Franklin is credited as being the inventor of the electrostatic motor back in the 1700s, but its power output was modest. The Wimhurst electrostatic generator is a high voltage mechanism developed in the 1800s which can be hand or self-started and will produce dramatic sparking while charging Leyden jars. Today it's used in teaching about electricity, but its practical applications are considered inconsequential. A high-tech variation of the Wimhurst device is the Testatica, or Swiss ML converter. Developed by Paul Baumann of the Maternita community in Switzerland during the 70s, this free energy device is a marvel that has been in operation for more than 20 years, supplying electricity to the small, self-sufficient Christian community. Many technical experts have come away stumped by its excess output. However, because the community feels that the majority of mankind is not ready to be responsible for such unlimited energy, they're keeping the technology under wraps until such time the world is spiritually prepared. Other researchers, like Dr. Oleg Jefeminko, continue to pursue real-world applications for harnessing the electrostatic motor. His accomplishment, I feel, is the best, is that he used a specific type of electret, which is a waxy substance which holds charge, and uh, it's like, a, uh, in many ways, a magnet, electrical analog of a magnet. And he's achieved a 0.1 horsepower motor, which is a small device. So, and this runs continually on atmospheric electricity. Like the homopolar generator, the electrostatic motor is based on the dynamics of our Earth environment. As with wind and solar power, they offer real sustainable alternatives that, with only modest gains in efficiency, could contribute to the replacement of our current dependence on fossil fuels. Are we clever enough? to learn from the clues our planet is providing. Upon the foundation of innovative thinkers and inventors like Tesla and Moray, the modern age of free energy research began. In the 1950s, a 
as waves of flying saucer sightings occurred throughout the United States and while an infant space program was trying to catch up with the Russians' launch of Sputnik, a man named T. Townsend Brown was busy on experiments that defied conventional understanding about electricity, gravitation, and propulsion. Along with doctors Paul Byfield and Agnew Bonson, Brown took high voltage to the next extreme. In this rare home movie, the earliest experiments in electrogravitics are recorded. By using high voltages over 20,000 and up to 200,000 volts, Brown discovered that highly charged capacitors would exhibit a noticeable thrust in one direction. Although awarded a patent for his electrokinetic generator, no one has ever reproduced his experiment until recently. Larry Davenport, shown here demonstrating his replication of Brown's electrokinetic apparatus, explains. But when I first began to read Brown's stuff, I didn't quite understand the difference between the ion wind devices, which there's a lot of them out there, and some of them are, are very efficient as far as producing ion wind, and his particular apparatus. I finally decided to do Brown's work in, in uh, 1994. I looked at his device, I'd, I'd tried several different things and they hadn't worked, and I thought, well, Brown is supposed to be the pioneer of this, or so the people that make the claims and that uh, get the patents, they always refer to his name. So I thought, I'll go back and I'll try to do this. Getting it balanced was real important. His uh, method of propulsion specifically was using the charge separation, high voltage charge separation on a vehicle. He found that uh, circular craft were better for that application than uh, wing craft. However, um, Recently, we found through uh, Dr. Paul Violet's research that the B-2 bomber actually seems to qualify as an electrogravitic craft. Uh, the military has admitted that it uh, electrically charges the forward leading edge of the wings. Uh, there's also a very high dielectric being used. Depleted uranium is used on the uh, forward edge of the wings. And whether or not there are other applications for that technology and that uh, design, we're recognizing that because the exhaust gas is also negatively ionized, that all of a sudden we have the high voltage charge separation that's necessary to provide an extra propulsive force, especially at high velocities. So electrogravity uh, in that um, aspect is a very simple process, but does provide a good amount of force for a very small amount of energy input. As with many other promising inventions developed during the Cold War years, the National Secrecy Act prevented scientists like T. Townsend Brown from commercializing or even publicizing any technology which could potentially be interpreted as having a military application. The triumph of America's space exploration program gave way to the era of limits in the late 70s. The infamous energy crisis made us all aware of our dependence on finite resources. Many inventors promised dramatic results with devices they said would solve the crisis. Claims of over-unity, where power output exceeds input, were routinely announced. But when put to the test, most of their crude prototypes performed poorly, or not at all. Measuring methods were, and still are, extremely difficult to perform accurately. The few that did achieve modest gains in output were dismissed by mainstream academia and denied patents. And without patent protection, investors have no financial incentive to lay out the millions of dollars it takes to mass produce and market these devices, no matter how promising the technology. And after all, classical Newtonian dynamics got us to the moon, and Einstein's E equal MC squared explained that energy could neither be created nor destroyed. Anything else which seemed otherwise was labeled perpetual motion, unworthy of scientific examination. Uh, when I started out in 1980, um, free energy was something that we didn't talk about. We talked about it under, behind closed doors. Uh, the conferences often were visited by people we didn't know, 
and, um, and the information was spread in various means so that all of a sudden non-conventional energy, which was a phrase we developed, uh, was appearing in uh, military solicitations. So it's, it's, a, it's a controversial topic that at that time actually had the connotation that there was something from nothing. Therefore, it was unscientific, and these are a bunch of lunatics who are talking, and um, sooner or later the scientists will educate them about what's the, um, the various laws of physics that are being violated. Well, most of the scientists equated any notion of a free energy or over unity device as being a perpetual motion uh, machine and therefore utter nonsense. You see, it's, it's, a, it's a play on words. The scientists interpreted it one way, the guys trying to do it are looking at it as an open system. Now, fortunately today, we have a type of thermodynamics. Uh, you know, Nobel Prizes have been issued for it, to Prigogine, for example, uh, for systems not in thermodynamic equilibrium that do have. They're open systems, and the energy does flow in from outside and through them. Those kinds of systems can produce overunity. It's all perfectly legitimate physics. Today, most scientists are unaware of the literature that the zero-point energy even exists, mainly because most scientists aren't physicists. Now, a few of the, I went to school, and I became a PhD, planning a PhD in electrical engineering and systems engineering, and not one professor ever heard of it. And yet, there it was in the library. So part of it is most scientists are specialists in their own area, and science today is very fragmented. Now, for those that know that the zero-point energy exists, they may argue, well, it's random in its nature, and therefore it can't be tapped as an energy source. But very recent work in thermodynamics by Ilya Prigogine, who won the Nobel Prize in 1978, shows how this energy could become self-organized if, if the proper systems conditions could be fulfilled. And that's what's happening in some of the experiments and some of the inventions that are tapping this, this energy and producing anomalous energy. Another resistance is the physics community, especially, that really know about this energy, realize if you could tap it, everything would change. The nature of physics would change. Uh, the, the most important foundation of all physics would then be the quantum, uh, the quantum energy that's in embedded in space, and really, we don't understand it. And it's extremely mathematically difficult to do computations in it. And it turns out it's probably going to be the basis of string theory in the future. And therefore, what seems to be nothing will actually be understood as a field effect, as a tapping of um, energy that is already available but can't be seen. Um, even the radio waves, for example, the television set is a good example. Uh, if you show that to a primitive tribe, it looks like a magical box but it's literally converting invisible energy in the air to, um, to signals and pictures. The paddle wheel in the river that's used to power a mill, grind corn, is a free energy device. So is a windmill, for example. What we mean is we are taking the energy from an external source and using it. So it's an open system and the, the environment of the system is furnishing a flow of energy into the system which the system is then collecting and using. Primary requirements, it has to be an open system. It has to have an external source of energy to furnish the energy that we're going to use. And therefore, it's no more mysterious than a windmill. And now we're coming full circle and realizing that uh, physics and metaphysics, that um, some of the notions of the 19th century, such as the ether and the vortex, are now being dusted off. And those ideas are being melded with uh, modern experiments plus quantum mechanics and so forth into this magnificent, uh, magnificent synthesis of what I call sacred science, of a whole new science, a whole new physics in which consciousness remains or reigns supreme and where we don't have to follow any particular guru or a leader or anything like that, that we have everything we need in the universe that's ours to have right now. And these are some of the basic essence principles that lie underneath the discovery of free energy. The force of inertia is known in mechanics, but until only recently, it had been considered too weak and difficult to harness for propulsion. According to some theorists, like Hal Puthoff, inertia, like gravity, is what occurs when we try to accelerate an object against the zero-point fluctuations in the vacuum. We run into resistance, literally. Canadian inventor Roy Thunson has developed an inertial impulse propulsion engine which overcomes that resistance using centrifugal force. It pushes against nothing and emits no exhaust, 
but it's been calculated to be 20 times more efficient than a jet engine. Here, the Thornson inertial propulsion drive powers a canoe in a swimming pool. The motor, which is housed in a box, never contacts the water or air. In the pendulum test, unidirectional force is being generated to keep the pendulum to one side. Whether or not uh, we can demonstrate, as I have, with engineering analysis and um, and models that will climb and incline, will pass a, a pendulum test, in other words, stay on one side of the pendulum consistently, and even power a canoe in a swimming pool, commercialization of that device is still a, a very difficult road. And we see that in many inventions, but what I like to emphasize is my F over P uh, measurement of that is literally 20 times better than the jet engine. A jet engine, typically a commercial jet engine, um, the DC-9, I think, is the one that I analyzed, has about 0.016 newtons per watt. And then the, this is in the metric system. Now, when we look at the Thornson, he's able to achieve 0 0.3, 0 0.32 newtons per watt, literally 20 times better than the uh, jet engine. Roy Thornson is developing refinements to his system to increase its performance. Unfortunately, like many inventors, even with a U.S. patent in hand, he has yet to find sufficient investment capital to bring his motor to the marketplace. We've all seen these little toy gizmos that demonstrate lightning in the bottle. It's the electric phenomenon called plasma discharge. Various inventors, working independently, are coming up with some exotic combinations of gases, metals, and processes to actually squeeze excess electrical energy out of this phenomenon of nature. In 1996, Paolo and Alexandra Correa received the first patent for such a device called the Pulsed Abnormal Glow Discharge Reactor, the first of its kind to convert plasma discharge directly into electricity. This is a standard. Utah inventor Paul Pantone has developed what he calls the GEET fuel processor, a plasma generator similar to a super carburetor that actually appears to run on 80% water and is entirely non-polluting. This device replaces the carburetor and exhaust and combines them as one unit whereas this end of it acts as a miniature refinery, allowing the engine to run on everything from battery acid and water mixed to crude oil right out of the ground. This is Angola crude, 39.5 gravity. The exhaust coming down goes around and comes out here at the far end. The center chamber draws some of the heat from the exhaust, plus this tube takes some of the exhaust gases, takes them up into the chamber and bubbles them down to the bottom. The bubbles, as it comes through the fuel, are brought up to the top of the chamber, picked up through a tube, and fed up the center of the exhaust pipe. While they're being fed up the exhaust pipe, they are in a vacuum, and there is a heat exchange which occurs. This process has been argued, argued a few times to be either a plasma field, an electro field. We do know that it does have a slight radiation, which is not alpha, beta, or gamma. And we do have x-rays to show that whatever is coming from the unit does get affected different from stainless steel than uh, the regular steel. Yep.
when the temperature of the exhaust is the same as the air temperature going in from the air portion up here, normally one, three percent more oxygen coming out of the tailpipe than there is in the air we're breathing. And no carbon at all. The carbon vanishes. I wouldn't say vanishes, I would say transmuted into some other substance, a lighter element, because we have an abundance of lighter elements here that are not explained from down here. But during the heat process, uh, there are molecular changes. After running this engine from 1983 until now, and many times we had it running eight, eight, eight and a half hours a day, uh, we have never had to change the spark plug, change the oil, or clean it. We have taken the head off three times to inspect the inside of it, and it's been spotless. What we have here is the Pantone Geet device fitted to a Ford 2300cc four-cylinder engine. As you can see, we, had, we have a, a see-through container here, which holds the fuel. As the engine is started, air is drawn in by vacuum through the fuel and bubbles the fuel, the vapors of which are drawn off here. They travel down this hose into our reaction chamber. They go up the reaction chamber and return back out here to be intake to be taken into the engine through this tube. This is our air filter and this tube is connected to another valve, which are controlled by this linkage, operating the air intake and the fuel intake. This is the valve that controls the return air going through this tube into the bumper. During the testing with the 2300cc fitter, we have achieved efficiency up to and including 300% of normal. Uh, if this uh, engine normally got 20 miles to the gallon on the highway, uh, you'd now be looking at 60. Uh, our load tests and whatnot have not been completed, but we feel very confident that there's not going to be a, a power problem out there that wasn't in I the witnessed air. the uh, demonstrations so the by process, uh, uh, Paul Pantone, and I was astonished by the claim uh, of abil ability to use any uh, fuel or water, including mixed with oil and so forth. It's similar to something that's validated already by Gunnerman uh, that's uh, being used in the state of Nevada at the moment. Uh, however, uh, this is an even more shocking claim uh, because it appears that it is truly, if it's correct and if it can be validated, he seems quite open, uh, it appears that this may be yet another process which, uh, which does some kind of transmutation of elements. He claims there's no carbon coming out of the exhaust, which is, would be unthinkable for putting a, a hydrocarbon fuel in, even if it's mixed with water. You have to get carbon out. And, and he's claiming that there are no uh, CO or CO2 emissions from this, and there appear to be none visually. Uh, th that is, there appear to be no soot particles coming out of the exhaust. So I hold out some hopes for this. So our demonstration units that will be going out to about 25,000 stations between now and the end of the year or early next year are being retrofit as we speak now to include our system in the exhaust pipe and our injector body here with standard equipment that normally is supplied from the factory so that we can get it out to the public as quickly as possible. After being rejected by dozens of U.S. manufacturers, Pantone now has contracts with several major foreign countries. Recently, several U.S. companies have decided to take a second look.
fusion between the, these components. In 1989, two physicists from the University of Utah, Dr. Stanley Pons and Dr. Martin Fleshman, created a media frenzy with their announcement of cold fusion in a bottle. Although several independent experiments reported similar test results, the cry of fraud quickly went up at MIT and other prestigious universities. The debunking was swift and merciless. Throughout the history of science, any time there is something that is very threatening to the established ideas, such as Galileo's revelations through the telescope and his idea of following on others that the Earth goes around the sun, not vice versa, continental drift, uh, all sorts of claims that ultimately became validated, the initial reaction of science is to say this is nonsense and to reject it and not even to look at the data. And I would say that the cold fusion and free energy or new energy phenomena are so threatening to the underminings, uh, underpinnings of, of modern physics and chemistry and all other sciences that you, you would get the, you get the expected intensely negative reaction. The real story about cold fusion is that it never died. Soon after the announcement in Utah on March 23, 1989, uh, hundreds, thousands of people all over the world, scientists and engineers, began to try, <clears throat> they began to try to replicate the Pons and Fleischmann experiment. And positive results kept coming in uh, of all manner, uh, including the energy, the excess energy, far more out than in than could be possibly explained by any chemical reaction or any previously stored energy. The unfortunate situation was that the U.S. Department of Energy masterminded a, a bogus panel of so-called experts, who many of whom were biased from the start against the subject. They came up with the expected answer with only, with, within three months, and they ratified it within six months, even as the evidence continued. Those physicists nuclear physicists that have been working with hot fusion, the tokamaks, this type of thing, they have a monstrous amount of evidence that shows exactly what they expect to have happen with nuclear reactions in this hot gas plasma. They believe, and it's a good, a good first guess, that the nuclear reactions that would occur in a cold fusion cell should be the same. Well, Mother Nature doesn't always accept our predispositions to, to belief. Therefore, Mother Nature says, this is a different environment, these are different reactions, and hey guys, start studying a little harder and find out what's going on. The problems that occur in evaluating a cold fusion device have not been so much, does it work, but does it work every time? And many, uh, many scientists are of the opinion that if it doesn't work every time, then there's something wrong. Uh, basically, the problem has been in the preparation of the metal. Now, this is particularly true in the heavy water experiments of Pons and Fleischmann. Certain materials will just absolutely uh, close off the effect of the cells. Other things that are finding additions will promote the effect. So there's a lot of study going on in that area. So over 200 laboratories in over 30 countries have replicated or advanced or, or, or had successes in various types of cold fusion devices. The Patterson Power Cell of Clean Energy Technologies of Dallas, Texas, is one of the most spectacular devices in the cold fusion field. It also happens to be the first device that has a United States patent, which is also very important. It got it almost by accident, since there are hundreds of patent applications that the patent office is rejecting. What this cell is, is it's very similar to the Pons and Fleischmann concept, except it uses tiny little metal-coated beads with either nickel, palladium nickel, or even sometimes just nickel, and ordinary water, not the heavy water, or which Pons and Fleischmann started with. Uh, and it does produce, with a flowing stream of this liquid, or electrolyte, uh, with just a little bit of uh, lithium sulfate salt mixed in it, uh, it produces spectacular energy. In, in fact, in one experiment, uh, they turn the power off completely, and the cell continued to produce 20 watts of power, unmistakable, for uh, at least 14 hours. And my understanding is that could go on for a number of days longer. Uh, the typical uh, power ratios of this kind of a cell 
that's very robust, totally repeatable, is anywhere from uh, 10 to 1,000 to 1, okay, when you have even a tiny bit of input power. They've had it go over 1,000 watts with only a watt or so input electricity. Clearly, these cells can be made to self-sustain, that is, continue by themselves. Dennis Cravens is an independent scientist who has done first-hand research studying the effects of the Patterson power cell. The important thing is, uh, notice over here, total excess energy is usually in the megajoules range. If you run through a chemical calculation of how much metal you have in there, about 20 milligrams, turn the crank, how many moles is that, how much, you assume about 100 kcal per mole for your chemist types of a typical energetic reaction, if you can think of one, we can't think of one, but if there was one, uh, you maybe get 32 kcals if you burned all the metal. So we are three or four orders of magnitude more energy out of the system, integrated energy out, than if we were burning everything chemically. If you do the calculations, you'll find that you can't get there. It's more likely that a few percentage of them are in the millions of electron volt region. It's been revealed recently that the uh, Patterson cell will actually keep producing heat for at least 14 hours after it's shut off. This is a phenomenal discovery. It has not been advertised or publicized very well. But what that means is we're actually dealing with a free energy source. Uh, the inventors never use that phrase and for obvious purposes. Um, but the important thing is that it does need more understanding and, and also it has the keys to our, uh, uh, the type of device that we need. The interesting thing about the Patterson cell too is that as a byproduct it produces hydrogen and oxygen. It's actually using water, any type of water, and electrolyzing that water and then just exhausting the hydrogen and oxygen. Now we could see two views of that. For example, if we're actually forced into a situation where we're in an enclosed space and uh, not able to um, spend too much time outdoors, which we already spend 90% indoors anyways, um, the uh, supply of oxygen is uh, very valuable, uh, whether or not we even use the hydrogen. <clears throat> but it's possible we could also store the hydrogen and therefore have hydrogen-powered vehicles and use the oxygen indoors. Another area that has emerged as a result of cold fusion, which is every bit as uh, heretical and disastrous to the scientific enterprise, as the over unity and the greater energy out than in is the transmutation of metals uh, that is heavy metals in ordinary coal fusion experiments they have now seen in the metal changes in elements for example the production of copper the production of other isotopes such as rhodium uh, the change of palladium into other things uh, this is confirmed, there's no doubt about it, and it's occurring with minimal energy input. So what this leads to is an analogy with the old claims of the alchemists, who were able, uh, historically, they said, and there's some evidence that they were able to do it, to do low energy processes that produced gold from lead or mercury or other things. Um, this is now being done in laboratories, and every instance I know of in the history of science where a small effect was seen initially to produce something was later scaled up. So there's, it's quite possible that our culture will enter an age of alchemy in which low energy processes can make precious metals. As we look toward the future, I believe we'll be able to find ways in which we can create the kind of elements that we need by these low energy nuclear reactions. I think we'll be able to start adding to or picking apart or changing the nucleus of atoms to be able to get the kind of stable atoms that we need. But more important, I thoroughly believe that we will be able to take the radioactive materials add a proton or add some changes to it and make those radioactive materials non-radioactive. And that is going to be a great boon to our present uh, 
right uh, to our to clean up the mess that we've left behind from our atomic bombs from our nuclear power plants and of course from things like chernobyl so in the future we have laid the groundwork with cold fusion by which we'll be able to handle a whole array of nuclear changes that heretofore have been have been outside of the current model of what can be done with nuclear reactions there are many power companies throughout the United States that are now on alert and they're sending their representatives to coal fusion conferences. We meet them all the time. They give support. They, um, they really will be the vanguard of uh, the new energy age. Uh, I believe that uh, any utility company that does not get into this now is doomed because frankly when we have generators of electricity and heat that can stay in a home or a building uh, why would anyone want to be plugged into the grid the wire grid any longer this would make no sense people will argue against that but I think the grid will disappear a remarkable process for sure and one that offers exciting developments in the near future but does the task of extracting energy from our environment really require such exotic, ultra-advanced technology that potentially would still put it under the control of large profit-driven interest? The rare metal palladium still have to be prospected, mined, and purified. Or are there simpler in design, low-maintenance technologies available that could be bought off the shelf and installed by anyone for an affordable one-time fee? We're going to look in depth at several individuals and companies who have been working for years perfecting devices that they claim will do just that. No one person in the free energy field has been as determined and persistent as Mississippi inventor Joseph Newman. Since the 70s, Newman has been denied U.S. patents repeatedly on his energy machine, even though numerous engineers, scientists, and even congressmen have testified on his behalf. In 1968, I invented uh, a bike that would get a wheelie. And I used an 80-pound flywheel that I had built and took a positive clutch out of a 30-horsepower motor, put it above the axis of the back wheel. A kid would get up on it, build up inertia in that 80-pound flywheel. He'd engage that positive clutch. Immediately, the front end jump up off the ground. It'd leave black seats on the pavement about that long, and the kid's eyes would be, you know, get the biggest silver dollar. They were just ecstatic over it. But I had heard the word that a gyroscope was a stabilizer. So I went to the library, got a book on gyroscopes. And when I started reading the mechanical characteristics of a gyroscope, the question that had dogged my mind for three years, how did that current know which direction to go? And why was, it, why was it when you went parallel, you'd get nothing? I saw the laws of a gyroscope match that exactly. If you study the laws of a gyroscope, if you take uh, this little uh, gyroscope here, if I can spin it up, you can see that it does, but I think every kid knows it's true. Now, if you pivot that one direction, it goes one way. You pivot the other way, it goes the other way. If I turn it around 180 degrees, now if I push it up, it goes the opposite direction. Push it up, it goes the opposite direction. If I go parallel, it does not pivot. As long as I maintain a parallel position, that's exactly what happens when you move a conductor through a magnetic field. You push down on it, the current goes in one direction. You push up, it goes the opposite direction. You turn the magnet over 180 degrees, everything will reverse. You push down parallel to the lines of force uh, with the copper wire, and you get nothing. It told me that the energy in a magnetic field was a gyroscopic particle. Now, I didn't care what the rest of the world was saying because they couldn't answer my honest question. It was obvious to me the energy in a magnetic field consists of gyroscopic particles. It is the mechanical essence of Einstein's equation of equal to mc squared. It moves forward at c and it spins at c. That's Einstein's equation of equal to mc squared. It only occurs when you get atom alignment in material. I don't care if it's conductor or iron, what it is. When the atoms align, the magnetic field will appear, come outside the boundaries of the material, and gives you a running river that you can tap into. 
And what I'm going to show you is an energy technology that's going to totally change your life that the status quo power brokers have been fighting, and I'll show you the history of it. They didn't want you to have it, but you can see for yourself that this works, and the part of this for you is to see it is to watch these meters because these meters are going to show you there's more power in this system than flows from this battery. The magnet runs down this shaft from one end to the other. It's heck shape with six sided. This blue represents a coil running this way. The red represents a coil running at right angles to it. The commentator shows that you break that circuit every 90 degrees. So you fire into one coil, fire into the next coil. Now you notice this gets higher as it's running because the batteries start getting charged. Now this one's going from 200 up to 400. You see that there's more current being produced by this system than those batteries are capable of delivering because batteries will not produce RF power. So the RF power must be coming from the motor. Now RF power is true power and the way you know this, this meter only works by converting the heat and the heat is converted into electricity because it runs through a resistor. It's a very accurate measuring device. So you're well over twice the current is flowing in this system than these batteries are capable of delivering and the batteries cannot produce RF power. Now this is real power. It has to be coming from the system. It clearly shows that the energy output of the system is greater than the energy inputted into the system. And that's what I've been saying. That's what's more than 30 scientists who came to my home from around the world. Some of them came my way from England, signed affidavits that the invention worked. Uh, the special master to the court, Mr. William Schuyler, who was a former commissioner of patents, um, he was an electrical engineer. The federal judge chose him, saying his credentials were superb. He looked at those affidavits and gave the men the credit they were due. He said the evidence was overwhelming. The invention worked. There was no contradictory factual evidence. And the patent office had normally not followed the formalities of the patent law. To us as an observer, we see everything as motionless. We see objects and they sit still and everything in the shop sits still. And so we think that's to us, again, as to the observer, we think the natural state of our planet is non-motion. But when re in reality, you get down to the basic bank up of the atoms of this material and you see that the natural state of the universe is motion. The unnatural state is what I have concluded is the lack of motion to the observer because that's when it, can, it forms into something and becomes a solid mass that will be interreacted by other masses sitting close to it that causes it to sit still and not be able to travel because of its attraction. So we come along as the observer and we say the natural state of the, of the planets and the universe is lack of motion. Just like uh, we believe that so strongly, just several hundred years ago, we believed that the uh, Earth was the center of the universe and that uh, <coughs> we were everything. And they even believed that the stars, even back at Kepler times, was only uh, like a cake full of raisins three miles thick. And the stars were little tiny raisins in it. And that was our bias and our prejudice based on what we saw that everything should centralize around us. And uh, I'm saying now we should open our eyes and our brain to see the magnitude of what lays in front of us. Space travel will become a reality. Uh, our children growing up will have an excitement and a, uh, a universe to travel into. But the values of the human race has to change with that. While Joe Newman is still fighting for recognition and just compensation, Many entrepreneurs are racing to be the first into the marketplace with magnetic motors that are built with high-tech space-age materials and employ microprocessors to regulate pulsations and RPM. David Porter of Galtech Semiconductors demonstrates his recently patented permanent magnet motor called the Carousel Electric Generator. This is the latest version of the Carousel Motor Generator. Uh, it's a rotary version. Uh, rotary inside, there's 18 separate sections, what we call a coil section in here. 18 make up the outer diameter. Uh, there's six coils here that we're using to drive the motor. And the top here we have an encoder which sends a pulse down to the electronics and basically lets the electronics know where the rotor, the rotating part here, is in relationship to the coils and tells the coils when to turn on and off. 
Uh, that's done by a specific index point that the encoder has that sets the relationship between the two. And the electronics down here in the box is basically a set of uh, TTL logic counters. It counts the number of pulses from the encoder and it turns the power on and off to different coils depending on where the rotor is at the time. We have also hooked up to this system a connection to the computer over here. What it gives us the opportunity to do is change the duty cycle on the system. We can change it from a pulse rate of one pulse per cycle up to uh, 40 pulses per cycle, which would be a 100% duty cycle. Uh, that is incorporated in, and what we do is change the pulse rate on the computer. It downloads the data to the electronics. When the index pulse comes around, which comes around once per revolution, it updates the data in the counters, and that's what changes the pulse rate on the system. Yeah, we don't have an automatic start on the system right now. That's something that the Intel chip will do. We'll start it up at a pulse rate of approximately 13 pulses, which gives us a 16% duty cycle. It takes a while to spool up um, because, like I say, it works also as its own flywheel. So we build up the power gradually. The thing about this system is, is that everything floats on the magnetic field in there. Uh, you have very little internal friction. Once the system gets up to speed, it stabilizes at a certain RPM. Right now we're running at about a 30% duty cycle per channel. The speed is still coming up a little bit. Calculate the speed off of the scope here and we're running about 1,850 RPM. This white and the green shows the two channels on the motor. The little spikes there are the amount of time that each channel is on, and the flat part at the bottom is the amount that it's off. So you can see how much is pulsing and how much time it's off and how much time it's on. One of the analogies we like to use is, it's like uh, if you pick someone up and take them across the street, you use a lot of energy. If you put them in a tire, once you get it started, all you gotta do is tap it a little bit. And so you use a lot less energy to move the same load. And that's what we do, we build it up to a high speed and then we just tap it with a little, with a little juice as it goes around and we use the inertia built into the system to take it the rest, the rest of the way there. So we're using a, a high-speed pulse on the system. What we're doing is removing the energy from the magnet. The magnet has a specific life. They lose approximately 1% a year. So we're not actually trying to create energy from nothing. The system will not run forever. It's not perpetual motion. Uh, we use the amount of energy that is in the magnets. Once that energy is used up, the magnets can be taken out, they can be recharged. All we're doing is maximizing the efficiency of the electromagnetic flux density that's there to the production of electrical output. When will we be able to see free energy devices powering consumer products like this electric car? Well, they're already here, and you may be able to purchase one by the time you see this program. In Oklahoma, where oil has been king for over a century, inventor Troy Reed has been busy in his shop constructing rotating magnetic motors that he believes will soon revolutionize how we get around. And it does work. This is a new prototype of the magnetic motor, and if I can explain a little bit about what you call a magnetic field. All magnets, the big old wooden prototype, has a system. As the motor went over, it had a tension to jerk. Jerk over, like that. If you take this motor here, and you take your finger and rotate it, 
It doesn't have that jerkin in it. So what I've done, I got rid of the crankshaft. I got rid of the crankshaft. I've got rid of, of the, the injectors. And the system in this motor here, as you crank this motor up, and like you do the other one, the motor will start running. And uh, what I'll do, I'll energize it on this motor here. If you can see these amp gauges over here, this will come, when we get it up to about 150 volts, we'll unplug it and we'll turn the light on. If you turn this around where you can see this side here, all the working parts is behind this system here, operates from a little computer. It takes this five volts, it's 150 volts. What we're going to do, turn off all the switches, make sure there ain't nothing plugged into it. There's the plug. There's your 110 volts. Motor still running. You can ro all, operate this table come around. Still got energy running. Nothing tied up in the back of it. Nothing on the floor. Rotate around, still running off running electricity so we're looking hoping hoping this time next year that you'll be able to use it in your home so that's another and what's good about this you're talking about electric automobiles this car this right here can set it in the back of an electric automobile and generate electricity and charge batteries up in a car You can drive it anywhere you want to. You don't pollute the air. All the other electric automobiles that I've actually seen has been nothing but just standard transmission. This is an automatic transmission car. There's not a whole lot of what you call junk, I would call under cars. Uh, I've seen a lot of electric cars that had a lot of stuff in it. The only thing that this has, has a battery to run the uh, radio, uh, the blower. We've got two safety switches over here that can be mounted into an enclosed uh, system, but we did this where you could see, where people can see this car with the technology. It's a safety switch system. This is a, a controller box, a Curtis control box. It cuts the amperage down. So with the amperage, here's what's real good about electric automobiles. All electric automobiles that has search technology with this in it they create heat. They've got to have a fan to blow this blow this uh, this uh, Curtis controller off because it gets hot. We don't want that to get hot. We want to stay that cold because once it stays cold, you save on all the com all the computer chips that's in this com uh, controller. So that means you can go farther, longer, and you don't have no problems. This electric automobile has got two gauges in front of the shifter on the automatic transmission. It's called the voltage and the amperage. That's what I was talking about earlier about amperage on automobiles. Let's see if we can't get the amperage to go down instead of going up. The voltage on this here should say somewhere around 120 volts. When we start out, there's no amperage at all. So the gauges is down below here, and we're getting ready to take and go drive the car and uh, you can see for yourself what it does. All you do is just take and put it in gear and the motor sounds like a little sports car. Shifts, runs good, fantastic automobile, drives. If you'll see the amperage on the gate, see it going down? The amperage goes way down. That's, what's, that's what I like about an electric car. If you floorboard the car, the most it will do would just be about maybe 100 amps. And that's what we want to do, is to keep the amperage down on an electric car. So it'll go anywhere uh, really anybody wants to go. If you want to take a trip, you don't have to worry about it going to go plug in the house because it's called a surge technology. Uh, 
It's a beautiful automobile and I love it and I put a lot of hard work in this car and we're going to make it. No oil, no gas to fool with. And the technology is here. It's going to be here. It's going to go. It's going to work beautiful for the whole world, for mankind. See you around. This is your future, people. As we have seen so far, electromagnetism seems to be offering the most viable path for many contemporary inventors. The magnetic motor continues to challenge the over-unity barrier, but even simpler methods are being demonstrated through common ingenuity. Dennis Lee of Better World Technology has been struggling to pursue his dream of achieving energy independence for everyone on the planet. Held in prison for two years without ever being convicted of a crime, Lee mounts public demonstrations in major U.S. cities, lining up individual dealerships to market his devices. A controversial figure, who some dismiss as a fraud, and others see as legitimate, if outspoken, P.T. Barnum of free power to the people, Lee has assembled an impressive line of prototypes and processes, including those by other inventors like Yul Brown. Although he claims his machines are not utilizing zero-point energy because they draw heat from the surrounding air, his numerous devices supposedly achieve super-efficiency rates by recycling excess energy through closed-loop systems. I built the world's most efficient heat pump and uh, developed it, and these are the evaporators for that heat pump right here. They're eight feet high, three feet wide, now, the refrigerant we put in here boils at 40 degrees below zero. Therefore, any time, day or night, outside in a, rain, in a rainstorm or in a windstorm or hailstorm or a snowstorm, or just out on a nice hot sunny day or in the middle of a cold night, as long as the refrigerant that's inside this panel is colder than whatever the air is out here or the phenomenon that's hitting this panel, then the heat from the air or the sun or the wind or the rain or the sneet or the snow will be transferred into the refrigerant on the other side because it's the second law of thermodynamics. Hot goes to cold. So if this is the coldest thing outside, anything out there that touches it is going to give its heat to it. A little bit of heat goes a long way. That gas starts expanding like crazy and as it expands, it then is drawn into the compressor, not through suction, I've got engineers and inventors that don't like to use the term suction, but through negative pressure. So as the compressor is creating this negative pressure, the gas is migrating to it. And so a compressor is a gas pump, it'll pump gas. And so the gas is being pumped by the compressor into the compressor, elevated in temperature. And even though if you touch this panel, it's ice cold to your hand. And if you touch the line going out of the panel, it's still ice cold to your hand. When it hits that compressor, the compressor takes all the gas in this space, puts it in that space, elevates the pressure and the temperature. Going out of the compressor, do not touch that line whenever that thing is on because it's 200 to 250 degrees hot. And so that's where we get the heat. All of the heat is transferred in here. We then use a compressor to take the uh, relatively useless energy that we've got and elevate the temperature and pressure and make it very useful energy, then that heat would be transferred later. This is a direct drive compressor. This direct drive compressor takes uh, Freon from the uh, panels and it runs that because this direct drive is uh, causing the pistons to go up and down. That gives us heat into the boiler. The boiler expands the other Freon back through that into a double acting piston that's going back and forth. We're converting with mechanical apparatuses. We're converting that into shaft rotation. That shaft rotation turns this wheel. As this wheel turns, it causes the compressor to turn. As the compressor supplies the heat, it causes this wheel to turn. You might say these two wheels are powering each other. And by the way, once the Freon has taken the heat, it then uh, made the power, it then goes up here. This is a condenser. We're sucking water out of the bottom of the tank, could be the well and we're running the water through this pump right here that's also driven by the same drive mechanism, running the water into this condenser. It's the world's most efficient condenser at 100 degree delta T, 6 million BTUs. And as we're then running the water through, we're making the water hotter, but the water will also be being pumped. And as I do this, I'll show you the water being pumped. 
and then also we're cooling down the freon which is going into this canister and is being pumped right back into the boiler by a little trombone uh, pump that's running on the same cylinder you ready to try it let's go ahead and try it let's turn it on guys okay if you're ready maestro anytime you're ready okay so it is pumping water from energy taken out of the air and we'll light the lights too from excess energy so the lights are being lit from excess energy from the air they're pulsing it wasn't set up to do that so we don't have it stable but we thought we'd just demonstrate the excess power that we have main thing is it's pumping water it's supposed to be pumping water that's a closed loop because it's continuing to go through the boiler and in back I had a heat pump in a walk-in freezer. We cranked the temperature down to 20 degrees below zero in dead air space. Now imagine this, if you've got any background in refrigeration, we're in dead air space, the temperature is 20 below zero. We did it every single Saturday for an entire year. People from all over the world came to see it. We said, bring your own test equipment, take the thing apart if you want to. We had a $10,000 challenge to find any gimmick or anything in it. And Every single weekend, we cranked the temperature down to 20 below in dead airspace, and we made water hot enough to burn your hand from energy we took out of that box at 20 below at a 2 to 1 COP. Same average performance of the GE heat pump in America. Only it's 20 below in dead airspace. And we challenged all the heat pump manufacturers to come anytime you want to, either find a hoax with us or bring your unit down and see if you can do that. Nobody ever came. A lot of customers came, lots of people, people from all the world came, Pakistan, everywhere. So anyway, we're in here testing this every year, every, uh, every weekend for a year. And a man came to the show one day and what a, what a guy this was. Now we're trying to build this thing, it's going to take two years and two million dollars and I'm raising capital selling heat pump things to get the money. And a guy walks in and he comes up to me at the end of the show and he says, Mr. Lee, I am absolutely astonished. I want to shake your hand and I want to tell you, I have no doubt you have got the best heating system in the world. Yours tops everything out there from solar all the way down the line. You did it. But you need to know me. You know why you need to know me? Because I have built the world's most efficient heat engine and you have got the world's most efficient heat source. He says, if we got together with our two technologies, we could become the most dangerous men in the world. I thought, wow, I've never been the most dangerous man in the world. I've kind of wanted to be. And so, you see, this man's name was Dr. Fisher. Now, this guy built the steam, built, that proved that they built the steam engine wrong. I had the pleasure of building his unit in my research lab and we took his great big unit because why wouldn't I want a great big one? I don't want to put everybody on the grid system with a new system that can exploit them some more with all the arrogance that comes with it. I wanted to give people the opportunity to be totally independent of the grid system. Remember, that was my goal. So we took the big one we had and we scaled it down into a model not much, a little bit smaller than this one. It was a little smaller than this. It was about that long, it was about 13 inches long, 6 inches in diameter. And that one was going to be big enough to be able to power all the energy you needed for your house and so I didn't want one bigger than that. And by the way, that little unit could fit in the glove compartment of any American made car. I went across the United States of America telling my story. I told it in every state of the United States and I got a thousand people to join me telling my story. We put a media ad campaign together because the media wouldn't cover it so we ran commercials and we did a 60 second commercial cutting a power line and saying you can power your house with no electricity external electricity run your car with a new engine that runs with no gasoline we did a 60 second commercial nationwide as far as we can tell about 10 million people saw it and after that happened that was too much that couldn't be tolerated and so I got a letter from the state of California inviting me to come back to California to go to court. So I flew back from New Jersey to California to go to court, and when I walked into the court, 
the judge said, you're probably wondering why you're here. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, because I've been ordered by the state of California to put you in prison. And I said, well, that's really interesting. You're putting me in prison, but I've never been convicted of the crime. <laughs> How do I go to prison without a trial and without being convicted? And I said, you can't do that, can you? And he said, well, he says, I've been ordered by the state of California to put you in prison, so that's where you're going, but sounds like you got a hell of a case for appeal. That, by the way, is a quote. And I do have the transcript. I walked out of prison two years ago, and now we have rebuilt our whole national network of distribution of distributors. We're in every state of the United States. We're in every major county of the United States. We have people now who understand exactly how the government works, exactly how the big boys work, exactly how the energy companies work. And we've got it all figured out. And we've got far, far, far more technology than we ever had in 1987. We've got a lot more money than we ever had in 1987. And we're about to rock your world. As if the amazing over-unity results of these pioneering inventions are not enough. A curious combination of side effects to free energy research involves such things as the transmutation of metals, the formation of new isotopes, and yes, even anti-gravity. Levitation effects from spinning magnetic disks conjure up images of UFOs hovering in mid-air. British inventor John Serrell has led the way along these lines, but his technique is not the only approach. The remarkable works of Canadian inventor John Hutchison has drawn widespread attention from businessmen and government scientists since 1979 when he began using ultra-high electromagnetic frequencies to transform matter in some very unusual ways. It has come to be known as the Hutchison effect. The object you're seeing um, moving there is a form of levitation by uh, translational movement, meaning that the objects become lighter and can float around, the heaviest being the barium cylinder that you see there um, with the two wires coming out of it. it tends to slide around on seven pounds of its own weight. The physics of it is self-resonation of what they call a ferromagnetic and piezoelectric barium type name. Uh, through a power amplifier and broad and narrow uh, bands of electrical energy going into this crystal. So the applications of this in advanced applications using free energy or zero-point energy to power it would be in uh, propulsion technologies. This is a crystal converter unit that I made about a year ago to see if the principle worked and indeed it seems to work to this day. Um, the principles involve the Casimir effect and uh, space charge type of barrier technology in semiconductors and um, um, a jitter activity called zero-point energy that goes through time and space. The idea is to get the material inside this to interface with the uh, jittering action of zero-point energy. And moving on to what they may look like inside, I actually bring out a piece here of this material of common minerals and that produced in a special way. And I take a reading here. And I should be getting a higher reading. I had a hot spot somewhere on here. I have here almost a half a volt, as you can see. As one can see, there's no batteries in this or anything else except this crystalline material with different uh, configurations. And this is a steady state. It's always that and has been tested up to a year's time and under stress tests also. So which made me decide to then, of course, mount the same material in cylinders. Different cylinders, of course, there are different mixes in there, and I found that uh, that some of the cylinders are not as powerful as this material here, or this very tiny one here. Actually, this has more power than this large artillery shell unit here. And what I want to do, of course, is to um, <coughs> demonstrate it in the sense 
uh, but making actual power. And that means to turn a small motor. Okay, I'm attaching this to the base here. Another lead to the top, and it should spin, which it does. So yeah, basically, this kind of material powering motors. Of course, a very small motor at this time, but scaled up in larger amounts of, of material and power up to uh, several horsepower if needed. Hutchison hopes his simple shake-and-bake method of producing these crystal energy converters will attract investors who can see the potential of permanent batteries which never need charging. Non-toxic that will interface with zero-point energy in space and time. Hutchison's more dramatic experiments border on the paranormal and have generated more than just a passing interest from U.S. military research labs. We've had about 750 demonstrations of levitation, translational movements, uh, metallurgical samples falling apart, uh, changing into transmuted unknown metals. Uh, quite a variety of obscure types of effects, wood impregnated into uh, metals, other objects in metals, uh, monopole uh, magnetic fields written up in many journals. Um, quite a host or a Pandora's box of different types of effects on the outer edge of, of the scientific uh, community. In this remarkable series of video clips shot by Hutchison, we see what happens when he fine-tunes the electromagnetic frequencies aimed at target objects in his garage. On a subatomic level, I feel that there is a, a dimension shift activated by very conventional electrostatic RF fields that I use and Tesla waves that I use that actually form a keyway that opens up another area of time and space that may activate the zero-point energy fields and interdimensional reactions, let's say, to gravitational waves and time waves, or chronons, if you wish. Perhaps we're dealing in chronons and gravitons, which are maybe particles, and somehow causing a distortion, which causes objects to simply break apart or pulsate in the center uh, of stainless steel bars and fall apart, or to become weightless. ice cream in a plastic cup. Seventy pound cannonball.
what is uh, interesting and also frustrating about his invention is that he's using a combination of Tesla coil and Van de Graaff to produce a very disruptive and lifting experiments, which in one case, for example, uh, actually lifts a 19-pound bushing uh, toward the ceiling just from electromagnetic fields. Now, when we analyze that, we find that there's a position versus time graph that we can plot and also the velocity versus time. But when we actually analyze the um, acceleration versus time, it's uh, an increasing straight line. So we're forced as scientists to admit that we have a third derivative effect, which um, for my mind actually lends itself to an anomalous new force, which I call hyperforce, uh, because we have to take a derivative of that to finally get a flat straight line a constantly increasing acceleration. So the Hutchinson effect has been used as a benchmark for a comparison to many other high voltage propulsion devices. Electrogravity, in other words. Now that we've witnessed the awesome potential of these revolutionary new energy sources, some interesting questions begin to surface. What are the consequences to the environment, to the very fabric of space-time itself, once we began harnessing these little understood forces on a planetary scale. Remember the promise of nuclear energy? That electricity would be too cheap to meter? Are there downsides to tapping free energy that we may not be able to predict until it may be too late? We have effects which can get down now into the very fundamental thing that drives everything, the mind stuff, the connection of the mind to the body and everything. For example, if you were to generate extreme pulses, extreme powerful pulses of this so-called scalar potential stuff uh, with the hidden internal stuff, if you jerk that or hard enough, you jerk the normal smooth flow of time stream and what you really do is you snap the body loose from its mind connection. You jerk the two loose from each other. That's instantaneous death at every level. Every cell dies. Every germ dies, every paramecium dies, every virus dies, the whole body dies. So obviously if you're going to try to take, uh, think of energy in those enormous amounts, you're going to be extremely careful. You can't do that just willy-nilly without risking terrible effects from it. So there are some limitations that will emerge on this technology. There is a danger, however, that you may have too much uh, zero-point energy and then, of course, these things would heat up and explode which has happened a few times with these devices of mine. So, in essence, uh, it's an interesting technology to get involved in, but I notice that there's some precautions one needs to take if you're having too much drawing of, from the electromagnetic jitter of, of um, zero-point energy. You're going to get a, a minor meltdown. And I had to clean this area out here once because of a minor meltdown. Would a new energy source be dangerous, for example? I would, I would say, of course you have to respect it. I mean, it's energy, so therefore, it's always potentially dangerous. It's double-edged. And I think it's, it would take a healthy respect to, to investigate it. One should be cautious, and that's, that's very reasonable. I've heard some good things. I've heard there could be health effects. There could be good effects as well as the potential for detrimental effects. I think it's like anything else. It's energy. It could be used for good. It could be used for bad. It's up to us. Perhaps because of their traditional understanding of invisible forces like chi or ki, oriental cultures, especially the techno-enthusiastic Japanese, embrace the concept of free energy. Well-respected scientists like Sinichi Siki and Zehuji Inomata receiving substantial government and industry support. Meanwhile, the Japanese, of course, are beginning to commercially develop various systems. Uh, for example, uh, a Japanese consortium funds the Pones and Fleshman work. Uh, the, the Japanese uh, Toshiba Corporation is working with Inamata, and various other corporations are coming together to develop free energy options. And of course, Japan has no vested interest in oil. They don't have any domestic source. So it's, it's in their best interest to be the first kid on the block uh, to make little gizmos that will replace our circuit breakers and internal combustion engines. To understand this machine, 
you need, you know, mind change, paradigm shift in yourself, mm -hmm. you know. So far, physics, ordinary science, consider only material world. But we should think another world as an unseen world. And we should recognize that unseen world and material world is connected, connected. You know, this energy comes from the other dimension. have a true science when it is accepted in science and the true technology when all the phenomenology is thoroughly worked out and thoroughly understood when all the models are redone so that we adequately can model this theoretically and we can do engineering we can sit down and design the circuits they'll work every time we'll have components on the shelf we can buy assemble and they work we're not at that stage today we are at a stage today which is the birth of the baby we're not at the stage where it's already a teenager running around playing, uh, playing baseball on the baseball lot. We're at the birth of the baby, and the birth is very difficult because it's opposed by so many interests. The orthodox scientific community still uh, very adamantly oppose it because they think that it's nonsense. They think that it's this old idea of perpetual motion in a closed system, creating energy from nothing. And that is nonsense. You can't do that. Uh, there are very strong and very powerful economic interests in the world, probably the strongest economic interest in the world, which are adamantly opposed to it. Uh, can you see what this does to the oil-rich nations? Uh, can you see, eventually, can you see what this will do to many things? Now, actually, what it'll do, you'll phase the oil. Petrochemical industry won't go away. You still need the oil for the materials that's in it and the chemicals and so it'll be more and more petrochemical industry rather than keep burning and wasting the oil and putting all the pollutants in the uh, biosphere so many things will readjust uh, it's going to wrest control from a lot of the great wealthy control barons who now dominate the uh, largely the economic world and their world is going to change now what you're going to see I would predict uh, and we'll see if history bears this out when those barons really realize that this stuff is for real and it can be made to work and with the internet and with free publishing and computers and everything they can no longer contain the information and it's very embarrassing to keep killing the inventors that they stopped that about 15 years ago uh, at some point you're going to see an overwhelming availability of funds become available when the funds become available the scientists will change over into it because they go where the money goes. They're bought and paid for. Simple as that. You can't do research unless you've got the funds. You cut off the research grants, professor gets without a job. He, he leaves the university. And so science is simply bought and paid for in this country and much of the world. When the money goes, the science will go to it. Now that will put the sharp young graduate students on it finally with some funds to do the experiments and work on their doctorates and so forth. You will have a very rapid assimilation and advancement of a totally new and extended electromagnetic science at the time. You get to a certain stage in scientific development, sometimes to stages where you're faced with problems and barriers and you sort of forced to rethink and go in different directions. I think we're seeing that one of those peculiar time periods in the history of science where we're going to overturn some cherished models, not, not too much, but make some changes and they'll open the door to an enormous amount of new technology in electricity and magnetism in nuclear reactions in motor development in battery applications in space flight and perhaps in anti-gravity uh, I think there are in, in creating scarce elements from plentiful elements I think we have just reached a plateau now where the the world's door is opening to what a millennium of new science we're talking about real life hardware we're talking about experiments in science that are telling us beyond any reasonable doubt that we have technologies that will enable us to be free from the bondage that we now feel free from uh, some of these economic uh, constraints that we've created for ourselves because you see if energy is free and it will be very shortly food is free, housing is free, then 
We're free to create our, our, express our creative gifts and not be like drones. And we're also free to explore our greater selves. And it's going to be a very exciting time coming up. The future of the world, as seen by conventional thinkers, or even many far-reaching thinkers, is uh, tame compared to what a coal fusion and free energy is going to do. No aspect of human culture will be untouched by the, this energy revolution. The very fact that the material that covers 70% of the, the, the planet's surface will now be available as a fuel source, and the, and the uh, fact that water makes up a, a huge percentage of our bodies, and this is a fuel and a source of energy, this is going to have incredible uh, psychological and religious and historical and geopolitical implications. The Middle East uh, picture and the strength of the uh, oil interest there is going to be drastically altered. Uh, air pollution will be abolished in most cities that are now affected by the internal combustion engine. And uh, space travel, which is a favorite subject of mine, will be transformed. The ability to travel to the planets and to the stars will be um, given a gigantic boost, one that I never in my lifetime expected uh, as an engineer who deals with those things. Some people are saying that the title of my book, The Coming Energy Revolution, is uh, a bit fearsome, that uh, revolution implies a sudden radical change and that uh, the status quo uh, will suffer and uh, that people whose jobs depend on the status quo will, will suffer. Uh, so perhaps evolution is a uh, better to way, way to look at it. But one way or another, our leaders, our political leaders, our uh, business leaders, our utility company executives have to address the changeover to clean energy sources. And it'll probably come from abroad, so it probably will happen fairly fast. I'm not really concerned myself about a radical shift because people seem to be on the verge of readiness for change. A lot of fear but also some positive anticipation. And maybe it takes an unraveling of what we have to put together a cleaner, more sane world. Is mankind ready? Do we have the maturity to handle it? Are we giving matches to a baby? That's, that's the question. Well, the first answer is, we're kind of backing ourselves against the wall. If we maintain the status quo, we're doomed anyway. It looks like we're going to get a shot by having this energy available to us. If we're not mature enough to handle it, well, I guess we're doomed either way. We have a chance to survive, a chance to go on, but it will take, in a way, a consciousness transformation, understands there's a consciousness movement and things like that, that people are starting to wake up. It's not just a me game now. It's a we game, and as we learn to work together and have empathy for one another, we can transcend the old selfish consciousness, which has caused all the problems and all the wars and everything else, into a recognition that we are a planetary being. We've only been able to present a handful of inventors and their remarkable devices in this program, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people worldwide, scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, who are actively working right now, researching and developing this phenomenal technology to the point where it can be successfully scaled up and mass marketed. We are at a pivotal crossroads in human history. Can we as a society release our fears associated with the violence of the past and embrace the unknown? Can we cast aside our rigid skepticism in favor of an open-minded spirit of inquisitiveness. Our very survival may depend on how we answer these questions. We hope we've given you enough of the necessary information with which you may base your future decisions regarding this exciting new field, one that will soon affect all of our lives and the very fate of our planet Earth as well. I'll see you at the finish line. The race is on.
you were fascinated by the amazing technologies and concepts you've just witnessed, now you can get even more valuable information and details from the new energy series. Five full-length videos, nine hours of in-depth conversations and demonstrations of free energy systems. Explore the worlds of inventors and theoretical physicists who are changing the paradigms of science. Volume First 1 all, features particle Tom Beardson. In particle physics, any electrical charge is automatically a broken symmetry. Now what this means is there is a virtual photon flux, a violent flux exchange between the vacuum itself, which is filled with this virtual photon flux. Volume 2, John Hutchison. I feel that that is also true. I think the Mayan Connect is also a uh, coherer of frequencies and transmit them out and then lock this doorway into space and time. This motor here drew 12 and a half amps. Volume 3, Joseph battery. Newman. This motor right here only draws 7 and a half amps. And look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the motor. Look at the size of the motor. Now this is exactly what I teach throughout my book. I taught it to Dr. Hastings. I've taught it to the world, but the larger you make the mass, then the, the smaller amount of power it will take and the more power it will produce. Volume, Volume 4 prototype. highlights Troy Reed. This is an old mechanical device. It's got, it's got two inner wheels on the inside and two outer shell wheels with magnets. they got eight magnets on this side, eight magnets on the inside here. Let's see what kind of torque we got at 75 PSI. And Volume 5, Lee. Dennis Lee. Okay, here it goes. <laughs> maxed it out so it went all the way off the end of this thing 150 foot pounds of torque by this engine they're just 29.95 for each take now the process or get all here, five for 119.95 a savings of 30 dollars place your order cycle. today call 1-800-795 tape t-a-p-e a right to lightworks audio and video post office box 661-593 Los Angeles, California, 90066.